Uh, the winner of this year's St. Francis College Literary Prize is Maud Casey. Um, the The author of The Man Who Walked Away. She is the author of three novels, The Shape of Things to Come, and Genealogy, as well as The Man Who Walked Away, as well as the collection of stories, Drastic. She is the recipient of the Calvino Prize, a DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Artist Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and numerous other international residency fellowships, including, most recently, the Dora Maar House and the BAU Institute at Carmago Summer Arts Residency Fellowship. Her stories have appeared in the Three Penny Review, Prairie Schooner, The American Scholar, The Normal School, Forklift, Ohio. This just goes on. Maud, you're not laughing at me. <laughs> See, you get used to being a provost here, and the faculty, they're forced to laugh at me. You know, and Never mind. It's early, I know. I thank you all, really, for getting up this early, especially Paul, who ran the whole way here. It was pretty amazing. Um, so. Next, David Gilbert, sitting on my left, is the author of the story collection Remote Feed and the novel The Normals. Uh, he's uh, the author of the novel Anne's Sons, which was nominated for the prize this year. His stories have appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, GQ, and Bomb. He lives in New York with his wife and three children. Renee Steinke, who's in the middle, uh, her most recent novel is Friendswood. Uh, it was just published by Riverhead Books. She is the author of the novels Holy Skirts, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and The Fires. Her essays and articles have appeared in the New York Times, Vogue, O Magazine, and Book Forum. She is also editor-at-large of the Literary Review and lives in Brooklyn. Marlon James. Uh, was born in Jamaica, uh, A Brief History of Seven Killings, uh, which was a finalist for this prize, was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and won the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature for Fiction, the, Annis the Annisfield Wolf Book Award for Fiction, and the Minnesota Book Award. It was also a New York Times notable book. His novel, The Book of Night Women, was also a Minnesota Book Award winner and National Book Critics Circle Award finalist, as well as a finalist for the NAACP Image Award. His first novel, John Crow's Devil, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for First Fiction and the Commonwealth Writers Prize, and was a New York Times editor's choice. James lives in Minneapolis. Paul Beatty, down at the end, uh, is the author of the novels The Sellout, Slumberland, Tough, The White Boy Shuffle, and two books of poetry, Big Bank, Take Little Bank, and Joker, Joker, Deuce. He is the editor of Hokum, an anthology of African-American humor. He received his MFA in creative writing from Brooklyn College and an MA in psychology from Boston University. He was born and raised in Los Angeles, which is very clear from this last novel, uh, and lives now in New York City. So, rather than listening to me much longer, because we're going to run out of time, um, this prize the St. Francis College Literary Prize was really conceived of uh, as a mid-career prize, um, as a way of supporting authors um, who've had a couple of books out, uh, had some success, hopefully, uh, some sales, um, and are hitting a point in their career where uh, I've been told by hanging out with a, a few writers, uh, things start to get a little more difficult. Uh, in terms of attracting attention, uh, attracting energy and enthusiasm, or generating energy and enthusiasm for themselves. Um, so the question that I have for all of you, um, and you can answer it in whatever order you like, uh, uh, is um, how was writing this book, the process of writing this third, fourth, or fifth book for um, some of you, um, how is this different than writing your first novel? Um, what are the, some of the things that uh, changed in the way that you uh, conceived of the novel or, or, or the way in which you worked? I, Mr. I, James. I, I can start <laughs> fine. Um, <clears throat> I think a big influence on me was, um, or a, a, a sort of a validation, was a discussion I saw with um, Chimamanda Adichie and Zadie Smith. So I'm about to swear, sorry. Okay. And um, and Chimamanda talks about writing her fuck you novel, and I was like, yeah, I think I was at the stage where I write the fuck you novel, 
um, the, the justification being, she says, you know, um, when you're writing, certainly when you're beginning writing, you have an idea of what a novel should be. And even sometimes second novel, I still, you have this idea. And she said, but the third novel, you know, people say, don't be didactic, don't ramble, so on. And she was, don't bludgeon. And she said, well, you know, if I bludgeon, I bludgeon. And I think that's the, the difference with this, where there are things in it where I would never have done with a first book or a second book. Um, it, the book rambles quite a bit, and I was like, you know, if I ramble, I ramble. So <laughs> I think that is the, for me, it's, it's where you sort of um, lose even your own restrictive ideas of what a book, just, lose the, just get rid of the word should, basically, um, which is something um, this guy on my shirt chest talks about that you know the first problem when you talk about anything which should is the word should that no fiction writer should know that word so that's sort of it kind of gotten rid of should and yeah this is where anybody else tries. yeah <laughs> thank you very much it's been great <laughs> uh yeah for me it was um you know the uh, writing it was not any easier you know, it wasn't like, oh, I learned how to write a novel after writing my first novel. Uh, it was equally as hard. I just became, you know, the first novel is kind of like the thing you have to just kind of, you, you kind of just vomit up and you just hope it's okay. And the second novel, you're like, okay, I can, I'm kind of a writer, I guess. And so you, uh, for me, I, I, came, I became more interested in actually, okay, let's see what's the structure and let's really try to, play with the form a little bit and um, kind of dive into trying to write like a, a meteor book, I guess, as opposed to that first novel, which was just, you know, just kind of getting it out there. But, I, you know, I was talking to someone about this prize and I was like, it's for a, a mid-list writer. And they're like, mid-list, ooh, they call you that? Because it's like when you hear mid-list, it seems like like middling, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, I'm so sorry you're a mid-list writer, you know? It's, I thought that was funny. Anyway. Right, we tried to avoid the yeah, publisher's yeah, no, like mid-list form. Mid mid-career much better, yeah. but I've always heard it as mid-list. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm in that yeah. mid-list. But I've never heard world. a writer say they're mid-career. It's always, it's always pronounced on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, I've, I've, right. we career. bestowed it on you. I would never even use the word career. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess for me, each, each of my books is really different. And um, I always feel like I have to almost invent a new, not a new, a, a new language for that book, a new kind of way of using English. And um, my, my first book, uh, uh, when I wrote my first book, I was sort of a recovering poet. And um, I had pretty much only published poetry. So um, there was a lot of, uh, just teaching myself how narrative worked, and, and, and I was also very interested in using poetic techniques in that book. And my second book was historical, and I was trying to, to really capture um, the language of Greenwich Village in the teens and 20s. And uh, my last book is set in Texas, and I was really interested in the idiom of, of Texas and the weirdness of Texas. And um, uh, it had a completely different structure than my first two books. So. Um, I, 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 maybe my next book could be my fuck you book. Yeah. Nope. yeah. But um, I don't have any shoulds. I just have a lot of, um, I, I think I try to do something really different each, each time I write a book. Um, I mean, I, th I think, I'm not sure I've written a, a fuck you book. I've written a fuck me. <laughs> 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 I've written about four of those. Um, in that each time it does feel like I kind of create an even greater obstacle challenge for myself. I mean, I think the difference between my first book and this last book wasn't that I knew really that much more about writing a novel because with each one it was sort of this reinvention and having to kind of figure out, okay, what is this world and what is the language for this world? But rather that I knew that the process included meltdowns, <laughs> um, you know, many, 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 many drafts. Um, and also, I mean, what everybody's been talking about in terms of structure, you know, I had a, 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 a greater sort of confidence that even if the structure wasn't there, and it wouldn't be there for a long while, that it would eventually 
make itself clear if I could just get up from the desk and stop crying. <laughs> um, yeah. So I just, I, th I think it, you know, now I feel like, okay, I'm not sure how this is going to happen or how many years it's going to take, but I know I can, I know I can get to the end. Um, and that, that's, that's profound. That's, that's mm -hmm. huge. Um, and I mean, the link from book to book for me has been to, I, I mean, I think to kind of go ever outward um, as I kind of went down the rabbit hole of um, sort of the birth of psychiatry, um, which is such a kind of rich, uh, rich place. But, but also, you know, I think I'm hoping to move toward um, even, you know, kind of even greater risk um, in terms of sort of playing around. And, oh, okay. none of it? <laughs> it's awful. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like writing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I was just saying, I, I, you know, my hope is that with, with each book, even though I do tend to kind of create these monstrous obstacles each time, that, that that's actually a good thing. And that, you know, the, the, the thing that I've gained um, as I've become a <laughs> mid-career mid uh, person is, is the feeling that it's, it's kind of worth it, you know, just to kind of flounder and, and crash around. Um, so I'm more, I'm more willing and more sort of, I think, brave in, in, in the face of, of, of that. Um, so. I don't have a whole lot to add to that, I guess. Um, for me, I think the process is pretty similar. Um, as I guess I've written four, uh, I don't know to go with the the fuck theme, I guess. Um, <laughs> Stay with the fuck Sorry. Yeah. You know, I, Look what for you me, they, they they kind of all start the same way. What the fuck, and they end with what the fuck. You know, so. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so I'm just trying to decide whether this will be the day that I say fuck for the first time in this room. I think that's it. My work here is done. <laughs> Again, let's all just leave now. Um, <laughs> So uh, I was speaking with Renee earlier, and uh, I thought uh, one of the questions that came up, one of the ideas that uh, she really um, floated, see, I'm a good historian. I give credit where credit is due, um, was a question also, and it, it sort of resonates with what uh, Maud was just saying in terms of being braver um, and more willing to experiment in this novel, um, or we could go back to Marlin's phrase uh, <laughs> of it being the fuck you novel. Um, I think that that's interesting in terms of sort of the, as part of a question about publishing now and working with publishers now um, in an age where there are declining revenues for authors and it's more difficult, there's more competition. Um, I guess my question is, has, has the change in the publishing world toward more uh, electronic books, e-books, and, and, and other platforms um, made you braver or less brave in terms of, of, of how you write and even what you think about writing? Let's start with Paul. I knew that. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Not for me. I mean, it's um, something I think about a little bit, not that much. But uh, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't need a lot of uh, prompting to be an asshole. So uh, <laughs> it's um, not that I'm being a little facetious, but that's a bit. But um, <laughs> you just want to swear in this hobby. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of why I write, maybe, I think. But uh, yeah, but I'm not sure what the question is, to be honest. You know? Yeah, it's, it's vague. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I. I, I yeah, I don't know. I, this is, I'm just going to ramble a little. Uh, you know, my world is pretty small, so I can never figure out if people are reading or aren't reading. You know, I read a lot. You know, I don't necessarily read so many books, but I do read a lot. Uh, I think people read more, you know, with all this electronic stuff that's happening. They read just the act of reading. Uh, I feel like books have, there's some weird space that's, uh, codified's not the right word, but um, 
there's a, a weird different for me, and it could be just age, but there's a weird kind of essentialism to books. You know, you know, I teach up at Columbia, and there's so many people that want to write. You know, and I'm not sure that for me that's the interesting thing. Like, what's that about? You know, not matter. So whether people want to read or not, you know. But uh, for me, I'm I'm always interested in what sparks all these people to want to write, especially if this atmosphere is true that people aren't reading. You know, so. Uh, yeah, I don't know. These are just questions I think about every now and then. Renee? Um, well, it, it seems to me like between, well, we were sort of talking about this because uh, between the in, the, in like the seven or eight years between my last book and this book, a lot of things changed. Um, and there were a lot of doom and gloom alerts. <laughs> and um, I, 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 my response to that really was just to be more, it made me, if possible, even more passionate about reading and more passionate about writing. And that was the, um, that's when I, when I've talked to my writer friends about it, that's sort of been their response too. And I, I feel like there's been a kind of an, a little bit of an urgent upswell of enthusiasm for um, books and literary culture. Literary writing really is what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. I guess. But, you know, like with, um, and I, I think that's evidenced partly by things like the Brooklyn Book Festival, but also um, the, the the success of independent publishers like Ray Wolf. And um, I think there's there are forces working against the market a little bit, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which which I find really um, optimistic. And and also all these people who want to write, hopefully they also are big readers. You know, you, you would one would hope. So. Mm -hmm. I, think, I mean, I think. Um, the ind you know independent publishers and, and uh, <laughs> um, the in you know sort of the the independent publishers and the small presses really give me a lot of hope in terms of creating these other venues for because I you know I feel like I'm only kind of moving toward weirder and weirder <laughs> books um, and you know not all of it is is necessarily I mean I certainly don't think of the market when I'm writing which is may be a problem but um, I don't feel like it is and it's not where I started as a writer and I don't think it's gonna be where I end um, so that so you know even as there's all this kind of gloom and doom I think there's a lot of energy um, going into creating kind of really interesting um, smaller places um, for people to publish kind of less less marketable however you want to term it you know sort of interesting wilder stuff so so that gives me a lot of hope um and i think it's interesting so. I'm, i've never really bought into this doom and gloom thing i kind of think it's bullshit mm -hmm. um i you know it's it's the industry is not in doom and gloom because nobody's reading your friends at your cocktail party and i think sometimes we have this idea that because the people who are in this little sort of clique are in the center of the universe, and clearly nobody's reading anything. And I think it's it's, it's this is it's very insular, and it, I've always, always thought there's something very elitist about that whole mm -hmm. the industry is doomed. It's like when people say it's the end of the novel, and I'm like, it survived extermination campaigns, it survived plagues, it survived all sorts of inquisitions, it survived all sorts of banning. But irony is going to kill the novel. It's like. <laughs> So, or snark is going to destroy it. Ooh. Yeah, ooh. So I've never really bought into it. Um, and uh, I don't know, because you know, this, is, this is a riskiest book of, you know, I've written. And I'm not being naive about it. I think there are lots of aspects of the industry that is kind of terrible. Um, but I think, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, there's always something that struck me a little disingenuous about screaming the sort of doom and gloom thing. Um, people forget that the biggest selling novel of the 50s was Peyton Place. It has not aged well with years. In fact, it wasn't good then either. Um, so in terms of our definition of bad, it was always bad. Um, in our definition of good, yeah, it was all, it's, it's, it's kind of good. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, this is also, you know, this is also the year where, where um, you know, a really, really bracing um, incendiary book of poetry has sold nearly over 30,000 copies. You know, Claudia Rankin Citizen, it's, it's that kind of year. So I think it's, um, you can always find evidence to the contrary. So I'm sort of, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't have much to add. I think everyone's pretty much right. I mean, I think uh, there are aspects of the publishing world that I cannot possibly understand, and it still feels a little bit like it's the 1950s, and uh, they really don't know what they're doing, but God bless them, and I hope they figure it out <laughs> real soon. Uh, but what, you know, I write a little bit for TV, and that's fun. I enjoy that, too, and TV's gotten interesting. I mean, I think that's, if you have to look at competition, you know, TV's gotten pretty uh, structurally uh, pretty uh, intricate, and they're creating these incredible worlds, you know? And I think that was always the power of uh, novelists, is that they could create a world, and now TV's kind of gotten onto that. And um, I think people do have a hunger to find something that they can fall into and get lost into. And yeah, TV's pretty easy and passive, but you know, there's still gonna be a world for books in which you, know, you, you can just dig in and there are always gonna be readers. It might not be as many readers as you want, but guess what? Uh, Hemingway didn't have as, as, as many readers as he wanted. Uh, I don't think Stephen King probably has as many readers <laughs> as he wants. Like you're always gonna get authors who are gonna kind of be complaining that they don't get read, but I think that's, I think probably Homer was like, people aren't listening to me, you know? <laughs> uh, so I think that's just kind of the way it works and you just have to do your work and hope that you can frankly make a living doing it. You know, I mean, that's the goal, right? Uh, that you can subsidize it by doing your other things, but that you have enough time to do the kind of work that you really want to do, and then hope that some publisher out there is interested in And then just cross your fingers and, and work on the next book. You know, that's always the, the secret, or that's the key for me, is not really worry about that stuff, just get on to the next thing, you know, and, and focus on that. Yeah. Um, okay, so what I've learned so far is you're all quite optimistic and that you swear a lot. Um, oh, I'm not optimistic. <laughs> I, I, I want to make that perfect. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of optimism. I feel that too. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if each of you would talk to us a little bit about this novel, the novel that you wrote that, that was chosen for this prize. Because un unfortunately, the jurors are not here. Um, they did a terrific job, I think. I, you know, it's, there are six t wonderful novels. And, and I thank, once again, uh, Sigrid Nunez and Aaron McGraw and Daniel Torday. Um, but they all were busy with uh, a, a number of other things uh, or they would have much more intelligent things to say than I. Um, but uh, if there's something that's, that's, that's driving all these other people into MFA programs and wanting, wanting to write and, and, and uh, hopefully to read as well, as you said, I'm wondering if there's uh, something about, for each of you with this novel, the novel that you've just uh, been nominated for, um, that you really want people to get or to, uh, walk away with or just to uh, think about? Maud? Um, well, I mean, something Paul said really resonated with me um, in terms of sort of like starting a book not knowing what's going on and leaving a book not knowing what's going on. Um, and for me, this, th I mean, this novel was very much um, driven by um, the, the story of this, this, this real uh, kind of obscure historical figure who was um, the patient in a 19th century French psychiatric case study. And I mean, what always interests me in, in books that I write and, and books that I read is sort of that place where um, there's kind of a question or many questions and you know a sense of mystery. Um, that is generative and that you know makes me think and keeps me interested and 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 this this man um he was he was uh the first the first diagnosed fugger and so basically what he did was he walked in a semi-trance state um though he always had a home um and so my in in my imagining of him my my sense of him was that there was a certain amount of uh part of his walking had a kind of ecstatic quality, but he had no control over that. Um, and so that when he stopped, he 
started to feel as though he were he was sort of disappearing. So he's in this kind of weird zone of you know, kind of achieving great heights of um, of emotion and transcendence, but they were not within his control. And then he was also completely miserable. And so I, I'd read about him. And years and years later, he was still with me. And it wasn't as though I thought, okay, I want to write this book that will solve this mystery. It was more like I want to kind of be in this mystery and 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 think about this. Um, I mean, so for me, in terms of this book, one of the one of the big obstacles was, you know, how do I how do I find my way into a conversation with history that doesn't sound stupid, <laughs> you know, and that it, that doesn't isn't clunky, and you know, how do I find the language of this character? Um, so I'm not, I feel like now I'm, I, yeah, that's, that's how this book went, um, and what kind of sustained me as I, as I wrote it, and what felt new about it was kind of finding this, this way to, to be in conversation with, with history. Um, so. Marlon said something that I, I just feel like apropos about a lot of stuff, which is this idea of should, and, uh. I just it just transcends the way we think. I think so much mm -hmm. things should be this way. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying nothing should be. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, it's uh, it's a, not a word that I use very much actually. <laughs> but um, uh, and in and, and thinking about that, uh, I think you know my book was about like what should things be. You know, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but uh, you know, and and just based around uh, how I see life, I guess, and uh. You know, one thing is I never know if I'm if I should be seeing myself this way, if I should be seeing myself in this context. Should people be seeing me this way? Should, you know, in this this whole thing. Uh, I don't know. I'm stuck on this word for some reason. Forgive me. Uh, so uh, I tend to just come up with things that shouldn't go together, and I try to figure out how they go together. Uh, I'm not hard. Have a hard time talking about my books. I should be able to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I can say one thing, I guess. So one of the things is there was a, I guess you guys, maybe since the movie, you guys have all heard of Compton, California. I'm from LA, I don't know Compton very well. It's a place that I've, uh, I go through every now and then. I have a good friend who's a principal in Compton. My sister teaches there. And so, uh, you know, ever since I was little, you know, you drive through Compton, this then all black, now majority Latino neighborhood but you go through there and you see horses people on horseback and stuff like that and I never went oh I shouldn't be seeing this but there's something similar to that you know and so uh, I had all these things that I shouldn't talk about in this book and I needed to make a place that shouldn't exist and so I kind of mm. based it in this weird kind of place and I think the hardest thing was to make something that you know in our you know the weird kind of schemata that we use to see the world, like a place that shouldn't exist, that does exist, feel real. I mean, that was very hard. So uh, I know I'm not making any sense, but um, ah, plenty. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 very first, the very first paragraph I wrote in this novel is now on page 458, <laughs> which gives an idea of the process for this book. I really wasn't trying to write um, a novel. I certainly wasn't trying to write a long one. And um, what I had at one point was this these series of failed novellas. And I, I, I actually was having dinner with a friend of mine, my friend Rachel, who's actually no longer with us. And I said, I don't know whose story this is. And she said, why do you think it's one person's story? And then she sent me off to go, go back and read As I Lay Dying by Faulkner. And that was kind of the eureka moment that, oh, it's, it's all, these other, all these characters um, you know, it's it's no one person's story; it's everybody's story. The one thing that I think that you sort of the the connective tissue I saw with them wasn't even Marley. It was uh, me trying to make sense of the seventies, because uh, you know, I mean, I was six in nineteen seventy six. So the seventy, you know, a, a crisis for me is Starsky or Hutch. <laughs> uh, that was a crisis. You know, the crisis is is you know. You, you go and watch Stevie Wonder playing on Sesame Street. It's it's um, it's it, I it, the 70s was kind of a world of wonder for me, but it was a disaster for a lot of other people. 
and um, th that was a lot of it was I think some uh, in in some ways novelists write because they have mysteries to solve or or at least render because I didn't solve anything um, but that was it mostly just um, why what happened in the 70s and how why did it keep echoing all the way to the 90s and that's kind of what drove it after figuring out oh this is a novel that's just a series of failed short stories and novellas so uh, I'm from a small town in Texas called Friendswood and um, I started this novel when or I got the idea for this novel when George Bush was still president and um, I then, as now, cringe a lot about stories set in Texas. Uh, recently, we have the, <coughs> the um, student who was arrested for bringing a clock to school, for example. It like, seems like Texas gets weirder and weirder. Mm -hmm. And um, so I kind of wrote this book partly to work through my um, very mixed feelings about Texas. And um, it's the first book that um, I've written that is from, has several different stories, like mm -hmm. Marlon was talking about, and that was interesting to me. It was the first time I wrote from the perspective of, um, I have two male characters, I had never done that before. Um, and um, the other thing that sort of inspired this book was, so um, uh, the town I grew up in is right next to the oil fields, and um, there was a really terrible uh, environmental disaster right next to my town where, um, a company was dumping chemicals for decades and it got into the water supply and a subdivision was built right next to this um, old field and um, pretty quickly babies were born with a lot of birth defects, so there was a huge rate of cancer and they ended up just com completely demolishing this subdivision, li literally bulldozing it. It was the biggest Superfund site since Love Canal. So I was interested in the repercussions of that and the people in the town, how that played out that later. Um, and um, the, the novel is uh, autobiographical just in the sense that it's the place where I'm from, but all the characters are made up. Uh, but I was really trying to get at, um, you know, the weirdness of people denying that this thing happened, honestly. Some, pe some of the characters, some of the people in, the, in, the, in this town still kind of deny that this, this whole disaster happened, and then some people are still are still very, very much angry, grieving, um, have lost people to cancer, and um, it's this very interesting tension. And that's part of the weirdness of Texas. Like you have the sort of cantankerous atheist sitting, living right next door to the, you know, fundamentalist Christian, and um, you know, you you have the oil fields right next to. Um, subdivisions and and houses and um it's it's uh so that's that's really what i was trying to do uh i have to thank saint francis college because i wrote this book it came out like two years ago and um so i got an email what three months ago saying you've been nominated for this i'm like where is there a time machine here what happened <laughs> i mean I, you know i've already kind of forgotten about this book and been trying to write a new one and um so it was, it was great. It was like, okay, I, back t to here. This is good. Um, so thank you. Um, for me, it was, uh, you know, most first novels are kind of like, you know, you might, it, they can tend to be very autobiographical. Uh, my first novel was not. I was like, I'm not going to do that. And then, this, and then I had such a hard experience writing that. I didn't know if I was going to write books again. I was like, okay, the second book, screw it. I'm just going to do a very autobiographical novel. So... Uh, and then I was having such a hard time writing. I did the, you know, cop out where I was like, okay, I'm going to write about a writer. You know, that's boy, alert the media. There's a, <laughs> there's a, a new uh, theme. And uh, but that was kind of fun because I could write about how much I don't like writing. Uh, and uh, and then like Marlon, when you're kind of like. I've got all these short stories, what the hell am I gonna do with them? And I'm like, screw it, I'm just gonna throw every little scrap of writing I've ever done into this book. Since it's about a writer, I can say, oh yeah, he wrote this in the 50s and just throw it in there. So it was kind of a way for me to kind of clear out my uh, top drawer and, and all the little ideas of, um, 
novels that you're like, oh, this is great, and then you actually really think about it, and you're like, oh, this is no way would this work, but it kind of works as a first paragraph, you know? So I could throw in, like, the guy's career and just kind of get rid of all those ideas. It's kind of like what Borges said, you know, someone asked him, you know, uh, uh, why don't you write novels? And he said, well, every time I think about writing a novel, I just write a review of that novel, and that's what I do. And so it was kind of like that. And so, you know, for me, it was really, um, and, and this is going to sound like glib, but I didn't know if I was ever going to write another book again, so I was just like, I'm just going to throw everything out there and just put it all out there, because it takes me about, you know, five or six years to write, and to write a book, and you just, you, in that process, you just don't know if you're really going to make it to the other side, and you don't know if you really have a career, so uh, I just kind of put everything into this one book, um, and uh, and I'm glad, thank you for bringing it back up because now it's like, okay, I, I am, I guess, a writer. Because I don't know about you guys, but I ask that question to myself all the time is you're just like, what the hell am I doing? Um, so yeah, and Sons was just kind of an attempt just to get all my feelings about writing out there and also to do my kind of New York story on the Upper East Side. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, we have about five minutes uh, for questions from the audience. I'm really curious about the horseback riding in Compton. <laughs> Is there a stable near there? I mean, what's the, because I've been in LA, I don't see people riding except like in the parks, like way up in the hills and stuff. So I was so curious. I know that's not a real writerly question, but I haven't been able to forget that you said that. But, uh, I grew up in LA, um, yeah, 60s, 70s, I guess. So, you know, uh, I have a good mom, and uh, she would take us to uh, this neighborhood, this ritzy neighborhood called Pacific Palisades, and so you would see horses there because we'd go to these polo matches, and she would take us to the, I don't know if it still exists, to the Watts Parade, which was like an anniversary of the riots, and we'd have to go through Compton, and you would see people on horseback through there. Uh, yeah, my sister tells stories, she, she teaches in Compton, and so kids come to school with milk that they've bought at the neighbor's cow, you know? It's just like for a quarter in a little plastic cup covered with, you know, cellophane. And so, and, and then so I realized it's like a California thing. I was just in Richmond, California. Anybody know Richmond? It's like a bigger Compton in a weird way. It's the first time I've ever been to Richmond. And people are on horseback in Richmond. So, um, you know, it's just, it's, you know, Cal LA is still the desert, you know? It's like every now and then I get these flashes and you forget how agricultural the whole place used to be. And so, you know, there's little pockets, little holdovers of this stuff, you know, and, and uh, a woman has an equestrian school in Compton, you know, so it's, there's a rodeo, you know, like a lot of the Mexican Americans who've brought like, you know, these traditions of these like little uh, rodeos. I don't know, I'm not answering your question. I don't know how to answer it, but it's a long ongoing thing that, you know, that they're sort of trying to legislate out for a number of reasons, but. Uh, Read from, I know his book called Big Bank, Little Bank, and I just found it very interesting that one of the best reviews of him was in the Wall Street Journal. I wondered if he had a comment on that. <laughs> uh, I guess I have a brief comment about that. What's that all? Uh, what's happening, man? Um, I think the, the thing about the Wall Street Journal was weird. I think it's the first time I've ever had a book reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. I'm not sure. I don't keep up that much. But uh, one thing was nice is that the review in the Times was really glowing about the first 100 pages, and the review in the Wall Street Journal was really glowing about the last 200 pages. <laughs> so that was actually really nice. So <laughs> yeah, put them together. <laughs> so that was good. Yeah, thank you. And then there's one more in the back there. This question is from Marlon. Um, I love you, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> For, um, I don't want to ruin the book for anybody, but I know you mentioned that you were trying to figure out a mystery around the, you were trying to figure out the 70s with your book. Yeah. But there any, are there any particular themes that you were, or themes of mysteries that you were trying to figure out? Well, some of it, you know, a, a lot of what happens in the book, some of the more ridiculous parts of the book are actually happened. Um, people, in, in, for example, when you're, when you're in, um, you like trying to figure out just how much a role, I, or not even a role, how much I was involved in the Cold War. 
um, in, in Jamaica, I did get the, the Democracies for Us coloring book. Where, and we didn't know how we got them, but it just showed up one day. And on page set, on, on the left side, you could color pictures of life in a democracy, and on the right side, you could color pictures of life in a totalitarian dictatorship. <laughs> and it would be things like that. On the left side, you can get a Twinkie. <laughs> on the right side, you have to line up for salt. <laughs> uh, so it's 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 me. It's it's kind of it, I'm recovering all of these sort of memories. I mean, the hovering thing over the whole book is the Cold War. Um, in the '76, the big fear is that Jamaica is going to go communist. So all these people, beginning with Henry Kissinger, um, you know, are, are in the country, and you just kind of can't figure it out. Figure out why. I'm um, in in nineteen seventy six. You have a spa in in a very small space. You have both Henry Kissinger and Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. um, which makes no sense. And you hear, and a lot of it too was me trying to make sense of all the rumors. Like I don't think Mick Jagger knew there was a plot to kidnap him and ransom him for two million dollars. Right. I don't think he still doesn't know. I think he still doesn't know that. But that's stuff you hear. So it's a lot of the um, the rumors that were going around in Jamaica, because you're not going to find any of this in history books. And me trying to sort of um, again make sense, make sense of all of that, and just how on a big scale that sort of Cold War thing sort of infiltrated us on even a day-to-day -day level, which was really surprising. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you all uh, for coming, and thank you to our authors. Uh, <laughs>